bom dia. Dr. Miguel Pinto Luz, Vice-Presidente da Câmara Municipal de Cascais, Your Highness, Princess Sahara, Sr. António Calçada de Sá, Presidente do Conselho da Diáspora Portuguesa, Professor Daniel Traça, o reitor da Nova School of Business and Economics, Professora Cátia Batista, Presidente do Conselho Científico da Nova África, Senhoras e Senhores Ministros, líderes empresariais, representantes da sociedade civil de África e da Europa, Senhoras e Senhores Oradores, Minhas Senhoras e Meus Senhores. It is an honor for me to address you in this opening ceremony of the 2022 edition of the Euro Africa Forum and to share a few reflections regarding the past, present and future of EU-Africa relations. Of all audiences, this might be one of the rare cases where I do not need to spend too long making the case as to why, firstly, the future of Africa is the future of all of us, and secondly, why EU-Africa relations should remain a top priority of the European Union's foreign policy. Nonetheless, there are a few ideas that I believe should be common ground when we speak about the way that Europe and Africa can and should work together. We should remember, firstly, a few, a few numbers. Firstly, Africa as a whole enjoyed more than two decades of sustained economic growth until the recession hit the continent in 2020. Secondly, one in every three people in Africa now belong to the middle class Although this expression is very debatable, the fact remains that substantial parts of the African population have seen considerable cha changes in their standard of living. Thirdly, a quarter of the global population will be African in 2050. Fourthly, 2020 was one of the Africa's bloodiest years of the 21st century, with close to 30 active state-based conflicts. Fifthly, Africa is witnessing a democratic decline, with more Africans living under fully or partially authoritarian states today than in recent periods. And as for Europe, well, the European Union is Africa's main trading partner, and it provides um, the most of both development and humanitarian assistance. The European Union and its member states have historically been the biggest investors in Africa, despite the impacts of the pandemic on uh, foreign direct investment. African youth will outnumber European Union youth by a proportion of 12 to 1, 12 to 1 by 2070, and European demographic decline needs to take this on board. Fourthly, the European Union has provided more than 3.5 billion euros through the African Peace Facility since 2004 to promote peace, security, and good governance on the continent. And having channeled most of this, Support, most of the support through the African Union, this represents also very clear contribution to institution building. Fifthly, Europe and Africa together represent more than 40% of the membership of the United Nations and can therefore act as important guarantors of the values that are enshrined in the UN Charter and the multilateral system. So the implicit argument from these brief data points is that the importance of EU-Africa relations is undeniable. For Portugal, a long-standing advocate of Africa in Europe and around the world, this comes as no surprise. The relationship between uh, the Europe and the African continent has been a natural defining feature of our foreign policy, not only because of historical and cultural linkages, but especially as a result of unwavering belief in the potential of Africa and Africans. Over the years, Portugal has been a strong and committed bridge builder with Africa. The first two EU-Africa summits in 2000 and 2007 took place during the Portuguese presidencies of the European Union. In the 2000, and this was of course not a coincidence, in the 2007 summit, which was held in Lisbon, the European Union adopted the joint Africa-EU strategy, which remains a significant milestone in the relations between the two regions. In our last presidency of the European Union in 2021, we promoted a forward-looking post-pandemic partnership with Africa. This was one of our top priorities and initiatives such as the EU Africa High-Level Green Investment Forum helped to identify new solutions and 
joint investment opportunities for the green transition. But these are times of disruption, as you rightly point out in the title of this year's event. The sixth EU Africa summit last February took place as both continents were still seeking to deal with the consequences of the pandemic. The emphasis had to be placed on solidarity with clear commitments on vaccine deliveries and investments regarding strengthening health capabilities. But not only that, of course, the launch of the European Union's Global Gateway Investment Package with a 150 billion euro allocation to Africa was a landmark announcement and it was a timely acknowledgement of the very significant investment gap on the continent. This initiative, the Global Gateway, recognized that in times of disruption, Africa and Europe need to come together. And the Global Gateway Initiative also showed that there is an increasing capacity in the European Union to think big, as we must. Nonetheless, it is in the nature of disruption that new and surprising dynamics take over. And in fact, just a few days after the summit, the unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation brought new challenges, it revealed old cleavages, and it aggravated long-standing long -standing fragilities across the world, but especially in Africa. We are all aware of many of those fragilities. There is growing food insecurity. There are underdeveloped health capabilities. There is the first recession in Africa in a quarter of a century. There is a growing and unsustainable debt burden. There is a European need to diversify energy suppliers. And there is global vulnerability to disinformation campaigns about the conflict in Ukraine and about COVID-19 vaccination. And indeed, they often have the same source. Although one can wonder whether it is sufficient to meet the scale of these challenges, it is important to recall that the European Union sought responses to several of these issues, such as the more than 7 billion euros that were made available until 2024 to promote global food security. So we believe that in times of disruption, there is all the more need for Africa and Europe to come together and to devise sustainable mechanisms for mobilizing the necessary resources. What I would like to do for the next few minutes is to map out what I believe to be the traps and the opportunities along the way, about three key dimensions which should remain the anchor for European relations with Africa. Engagement, diversification, and integration. Firstly, on engagement. Africa is today a key arena of competing interests and of geopolitical rivalry. Russia, for example, is hosting its second Russian-Africa summit next year, although it is unclear whether its engagement with war in the Ukraine will allow for this to take place. The United States just last week announced a US-Africa summit in Washington in mid-December of this year. China has also maintained high-level dialogue over the past months in several formats, several sectors. The European Union is no exception. More and more member states from across the Union are developing their strategies for Africa and deploying greater resources in the continent. This we consider to be a good thing. This growing engagement, European engagement on the continent is an opportunity that we should seize because it is a prerequisite to a greater and deeper level of understanding, which in turn creates the grounding for doing more and doing better together. Countries with first-hand knowledge of Russian realities, such as the Czech Republic or Estonia or Finland, are capable of deconstructing the Russian narrative that is unfortunately still so persuasive, still so persuasive for several African partners. States such as Germany and France can leverage their substantial financial and technical resources in order to generate necessary momentum. Portugal is a country with significant linguistic and cultural proximity to various African peoples that can help maximize the impact of resources that are mobilized towards common objectives. This opportunity is, however, victim of a recurring trap that has been present in independent African history. The notion of a zero-sum game approach that is such an important part of the most tragic situations, such as in Mali or Sudan. With a greater or lesser degree of like-mindedness, there should be no false dichotomies or fears to engage 
And open-minded international partnerships need to be part of our approach over the next few years, though, of course, with full respect for the principles that we cherish in international relations. The point that I'd like to make here is that in times of disruption, Africa and Europe can and should come together and leverage their comparative advantages for common objectives. Institutionally, we must clearly do better, starting by capitalizing on the existing structures to generate a dense network of regular dialogues in between summits, rather than hoping that meetings at the highest level every few years are going to be sufficient. The second dimension that I want to refer to is diversification. These days, there is a much more widespread understanding of the strategic importance of Africa in light of the challenges posed by unreliable suppliers of critical materials and the disruption of supply chains. Portugal has been making this point in European debates over many years, and we believe that it is now widely understood. Countries such as Senegal, Nigeria, Morocco, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, amongst others, have affirmed themselves as essential sources for energy and for critical raw materials for our households, supply chains, and economies. These countries and others are indispensable for the future of Europe and must be engaged with seriously when we look at the efforts that we must undertake as a union on our energy mix in the years and decades to come. On the other hand, this focus on mineral and agricultural commodities can come at a cost for both continents. The export and import mix in our trade exchanges remains imbalanced, and the reality is that it can become more imbalanced still. Despite the scale of our economic ties, close to two-thirds of the African goods that are exported to the European Union remain primary goods, such as oil, minerals, and food crops and a significant part of EU investment in the continent is focused on those sectors. Higher added, higher added value products, however, including manufactured goods, are predominantly amongst those that are imported in Africa from the European Union. So there is still a significant imbalance. COVID-19 was a wake-up call for us to support local manufacturing capa capabilities. Vaccines are now being produced in South Africa, Ghana, Rwanda, and Senegal with the support of the European Union. And this is a process that must continue, it must develop, and it must expand. In short, in times of disruption, Africa and Europe can come together, should come together, and they should be investing at the right scale to build capacity and to respond to pressing shortages. But we should go further. We need to increase the productive capacity in Africa, including of higher added value products. The geographical proximity, the strong track record of investment and development, and our shared linguistic environment make Africa a competitive production hub for Europe vis-a-vis -vis locations that are further away. Of course, this does not happen on its own. It requires substantive progress in education and training, in research and development, as well as in improving the business environment and the uh, level of entrepreneurship. This investment in, in what we often call the people-to-people -people exchanges remains the best antidote to competing narratives that sow mistrust and skepticism. Lastly, but certainly not the least important, I would like to say a few words on integration. Today, Africans are seeking to work more closely together, and rightly so. There are substantial benefits from exploring the potentialities of inter interdependence across the continent. If we look at the geography of countries in mainland Africa, one in every three nations has a border with at least five others, in, many, in some cases, many more. This geographical proximity has for centuries been a determinant of economic relations in those countries. The launch of the African Continental Free Trade Zone and the promotion of, an of the interregional uh, trade framework is set to provide a major impetus to changing current dynamics. If it is pro properly carried out, this integration is expected to raise income on the continent by 7% by 2035. That's over half a percentage point each year and lift at least 40 million people out of extreme poverty. Africa cannot miss this unique opportunity. 
but it is equally an opportunity for Europe. There is no better credential for being a leading partner of Africa in this specific process of integration than our European experience of building a single market. The process of integrating markets has a knock-on effect, leading to the structuring of new institutions, which in turn feed more positive dynamics. Take the case of COVID-19, for example. Faced with the challenges posed by the pandemic and the need to think in an integrated manner, Africans are now working on the establishment of an African medicines agency, as we have in Europe. What now looks as almost self-evident would not have been as easy to achieve some years ago. Sometimes we need disruption, sometimes we need shock. In times of disruption, Africa is currently coming together strongly to become more resilient against future shocks. This step is a welcome milestone which can be replicated in other fields if and as soon as the fruits of greater integration start to be reaped. Small-time political thinking often gets in the way of deeper steps forward, but the art of political leadership is to keep looking at the long-term goals. Since the establishment of the Organization of African Union, cooperation amongst African states has expanded significantly, and the 2063 agenda illustrates this very well. But courageous steps are still very necessary. One of the pillars of successful integration in Europe, for example, is the free movement of labor. With 22 young, million young people entering the African job market every year, the supply of human capital clearly exceeds the demand. And yet, if underused, what could be a source of prosperity will become a source of unrest, of underdevelopment, and of instability. The idea that mobility and migration is a development trap for the host state, this is an idea that is promoted by some people here in Europe as well as in other countries, and it is both counterproductive and harmful. What some people call unmanaged migration, I prefer to refer to as untapped human capital. We as states and societies have the duty to provide the right conditions for all to prosper, because migrants are themselves a source of prosperity for both their country of origin and the country of residence. More than half of African migrants move currently within Africa. Most Africans who migrate to the European Union are not refugees. They are just seeking to better their economic prospects. And close to 85% of, of migrant incomes are spent in the host country, with the rest being remittances. So, Clearly, there are benefits on both sides of this equation. In my view, we share a very clear interest in boosting mobility. Greater mobility would promote stronger people-to-people -people relations. It would lead to income convergence across regional communities, as well as the promotion of healthy brain circulation. There should be greater mobility between African states. Today, only ECOWAS citizens can travel without a visa to any other country that is part of the community. The protocol on the free movement of persons, which could be a very useful basis to work upon, has a very limited number of ratifications. On the other hand, as African nationals also migrate to Europe, we must promote greater mobility between the two regions. In 2020, 13% of all migrants in Europe were Africans, and more than Nine out of 10, more than 90% of these Africans arrived in Europe through regular channels, contrary to the scaremongering of some political leaders, or some political misleaders, I should say. Se me permitem aqui umas palavras em português, porque a África também é lusófona, não posso deixar de referir o acordo sobre mobilidade da comunidade dos países de língua portuguesa como um exemplo emblemático no plano da mobilidade e do reforço das relações entre povos. Nós estamos atualmente a adaptar a nossa legislação nacional para tirar o mais amplo partido possível desta potencialidade. Volvido um ano após a assinatura deste instrumento, em Luanda, a mobilidade e a circulação no espaço da Comunidade de Países de Língua Portuguesa, do Cplp, está à beira de passar por um incremento muito significativo. Neste período disruptivo, a África e a Europa estão a unir esforços desta feita em torno da língua portuguesa. 
Ladies and gentlemen, 15 years after the joint Africa-European Union strategy was adopted at the Lisbon summit of 2007, the time is ripe for some reflections. This forum provides the opportunity to do so. And I would like to finish by thanking the World Portuguese Network, o Conselho de Diáspora Portuguesa, for organizing this important event. I hope that as you pursue your discussions in the next two days, you can keep in mind this trinity which I believe we should not lose sight of. Engagement, differentiation, or diversification, and integration. Africa is not just the arena of geopolitical rivalry, just as Europe is not simply another competing actor on the ground. Africa is not just the producer of primary goods, just as Europe is not only a place to import high value added products from. Africa is not just made of geographical proximity, just as Europe is not simply at the receiving end of migratory flows. Africa and Europe can be all they want to be if the political will is there. And this is even more true in the current times of disruption that we are collectively going through. Thank you.